Hi, today do we have a guest for you, Dr. Alex Pascal, the founder of coaching.com. We're going to be talking about the disruption and democratization of coaching. Alex uses my favorite phrase, slowing down to speed up. And then you're going to find out how world tennis champion Andre Agassi can teach you things about coaching. Welcome to The Thinking Leader, brought to you by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives, military experts, and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world. Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Welcome to The Thinking Leader. Our guest today is Dr. Alex Pascal. Alex is an organizational psychologist the founder of Coaching.com, and a guy who is rethinking the entire field of executive coaching and leadership development. Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great to have you, Alex. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Likewise. Yeah. So, you know, both Marcus and I have done a little bit of coaching in our in our careers. What, to, what led you to start coaching.com yeah so coaching.com started 10 years ago even before it was coaching.com started as coach logics and the idea was well there's no real software platforms for coaching and i was working at a large leadership development consultancy that was global and we had 600 coaches and we were using a platform that was just not optimized for actually adding a lot of value to the coaching process. So that's how the idea started, just create an underlying operational platform for the emerging coaching industry. And that was 2012. The last seven years or so since 2015, 2016, coaching has really exploded, came into the scene and organizations are consuming it like never before. It used to be uh, that coaching happened at the top and now really a lot of it is by really using technology there's this idea of democratizing coaching and providing a lot more people with access to it in organizations. So it's been an exciting uh, 10 years for the coaching industry. That's amazing. Why, what do you think is driving that expanded interest in coaching, particularly in large organizations? Well, I think when you look at the nature of work today and how complex the world is, an approach that essentially asks you to stop in your tracks a little bit and kind of reframe the way you're thinking about things. And it's really the, I mean, the coaching philosophy is really about asking questions. It's, there's an assumption there that people know a lot about where they are, where they want to go. And if you, instead of kind of telling them what to do or sit them in front of a PowerPoint for three hours, if you actually can have some conversations with people that are skilled at making you question your assumptions, your beliefs, the way you're thinking about the frame that you're using to looking at, at the world, that that can lead to unlocking uh, potential. And of course, there's a lot of different uh, philosophies, modes, models within coaching, but the core philosophy really is, you know, let's empower people to find the solutions and the answers that they're looking for that oftentimes are already within you. That's amazing. I mean, that's, that's red team thinking too. I mean, at, uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, what we, we have a lot of, you know, tools and techniques and, and names for them all and stuff, but really at the base, we're trying to get people to ask hard questions of themselves, of their organizations, of others, and to challenge their assumptions. And it's amazing because when you think about it, and I think this speaks to the growth in the coaching that you talked about is that I think people realize that that's something we've stopped doing collectively yeah. as a society in the past few decades. And it's unfortunate. And it dates back, doesn't it, from Socrates, exactly. you know, two and a half thousand years ago. This is where this the Socratic method of questioning has evolved from and into what we're talking about today. And I think you nailed it perfectly, Alex, with this, this democratization 
of coaching is a f- fantastic phrase because that's exactly what has happened. And it's what's needed as we're all talking about this complex world, this VUCA world that we live in. We've got to question ourselves. We've got to question the organizations. We've got to question each other. And in doing so, if you do it in the right way, in a collaborative, agreeable way, we call it the art of contradiction, then you don't upset people. You don't rock the apple cart you know, in, the, in a malicious way. It's done with good intent and you all get the right outcomes you're looking for. But I think so many people are fearful of doing this today because they don't want to offend or upset people because people are very much feathering their own nest and doing things for their own agendas. And I think this this perspective of coaching and questioning breaks that barrier down and opens it up to have a far more effective conversation with each other. It does. And I don't think it's a coincidence that coaching emerged as a profession uh, at a time where we're getting dehumanized with technology, right? I run a technology company. I think technology obviously is an enabler for the next iteration of human experience but it needs to be human experience and i think when you look at you just go to a restaurant and you look at a couple on their either first date or their 2000 date so many of them are just on their phones right you know that's kind of what technology has done and it's created a lot of productivity gains and efficiency but at the cost of a lot of the things that made being human great, right? I mean, I, I watch a lot of Seinfeld and it, I think part of it is it's nice to see the 90s before everyone was on their yeah. phones, you know? It's like, and I, I think the I was watching emergence... an episode last yeah. night and I had, I, I Which had one? the same exact thought. Uh, the first one with Putty. The, oh, the stealing love Putty. the moves. Oh, that's, my that's, move. that's a good <laughs> one. Yeah, but you're giving me goosebumps though. So. Give me goosebumps. Just when you were saying that, people not talking, that loss of humanity, that is so important, isn't it? That's what that's what humans do well. We have great conversations. We argue with each other. We we have good discourse. It's what we've done for centuries, for thousands, and that it's it's what we're built to do. It's what we're great at doing. And as you said, we've been dehumanized with this influx of technology over the years. And while it's a remember watching the social dilemma and you know, these the the founders of Facebook and Instagram, they said for for every great thing that these technological platforms do, there's a dark side to the coin. And that dehumanization, I think, is. is very much what we're seeing is highly impactful to society today. Well, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't let their kids use technology. Like they, they have like their standard yeah. time. So even the, you know, CEO of Meta is like, mm, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's not well, such a good thing because yeah. let's <laughs> Let's create Facebook for kids, but I don't want my kids on it. You know, so right. that tells you something yeah. about the power of technology, the scale, where we are, the decisions that are being made by private companies that really, I mean, yeah. think about Twitter as like the town hall, but there's really, there's a lot happening. It's the scale of technology and, and the, the boundaries between government and private um, endeavors. Well, they say and it's the town hall, it's, but think about that. I mean, it's... There's never been a town hall in history until until the advent of mm-hmm. Twitter and, and social media, where people talk to each other with the same level of rancor, the same hostility, the same aggression that people do every day on these platforms. So they claim that mantle of being the public space, but the public space had rules. The public <laughs> space had civility. Right. The public say space. If you if you talked to somebody the way people talk to each other on Twitter, you get punched in the face, you know? Yeah, it's more people, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, people. the people there. <laughs> yeah, it's like the gladiatorial ring, isn't it, of the internet? But in reality, right. people don't behave that way. So again, I think it's it's not only dehumanizing, it's desensitizing humans because there's no way you would speak to people like you see people interact on Twitter, even on Facebook. You know, it's, it's brutal sometimes. And you think, why would you do that? That's not what we do as humans. Well, now then, then it bleeds over into real life where mm-hmm. you do have people talking to each other and yeah. treating each other in real life like they do on Twitter and Facebook. Yeah. And the result is, the you know, mass violence and, you know, yeah. incredibly yeah. It normalizes it, doesn't it? While basis. we dehumanize yeah. it, we are then normalizing that behavior because it's what people I mean, do look, most of the time. I mean, who's buying Twitter? The <laughs> troll in chief, you know, he's he's an incredible entrepreneur, but this guy is a troll, you know, it's like, right. it's like, it's so who's going to control that town square. So yeah, we live in very interesting times. So I, I do think that the coaching approach is a lot about getting to know ourselves better and doing that at scale. So a lot of people 
that really believe in coaching and there's we still have like the founda- the, the the founding members of coaching a lot of them still around because they started doing coaching maybe 40 years ago they were absolute trailblazer and in, uh, trailblazers but this tradition of having an approach like this goes back thousands of years like Marcus is saying so it's innately human to want to go and pierce deeply through your assumptions which sounds like red team uh, thinking um, and one thing you have to be careful with coaching and the use of technology as we scale it is that you don't confuse democratization with commoditization, right? right. And a lot of what's happening in coaching is it's, it's coaching is by definition unscalable because you have someone right. that is very skilled at listening and asking the right questions and knows human development and over time develops a good frame for the context upon which people are operating. That's why there's coaches that specialize in certain industries. Some don't, some work with people across industries, but it's really a flourishing field with a lot of different um, experts doing different things. But we have to be careful because by definition, coaching is not very scalable. So as we go about scaling it, it's really about leveraging technology to create efficiency to be able to provide that service at a, not at a cost that is too low for the coaches to want to do it, but those efficiency gains then get passed on to corporations that then can open up the balls for coaching so that more people can have access to it. It's a very bespoke thing is coaching. It's a very personal, it's a very relationship orientated capability that you know you, you are an effective coach when you develop that relationship with someone and create bespoke capabilities for them and nuances that are relevant to that individual. So, so to scale that is very hard. And as you said, Alex, I think the scaling comes from using technology to enable more people to access what's on offer rather than scaling the sort of one model fits all type of thing that we see in other types of coaching right now out there, but it doesn't work. So ultimately you've got to have that one-to-one capability. Yeah, it's not Uber. <laughs> Coaches are not Uber drivers, Love right? That. So, and I, I mean, a lot of what happened is because I mean, when you think about innovation, most of the time, what we refer to as innovation is not innovation. I mean, the Uber model of connecting kind of like these peer-to-peer kind of marketplace services, well, then people started to think about how do we apply that model to everything? And in some way, in some cases, it was successful, and in some other cases, not as much. And I think coaching needs a little more nuanced uh, approaches for scale. And I think we're starting to, to see some of that. That's interesting because, you, as you say, you have a technology company and you've brought you've you've spent the last ten years focused on bringing technology to coaching. What 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 is the appropriate role of technology in coaching? Yeah, I think it's it's around creating efficiencies as to how coaching is managed. Uh, we have a very unique approach at Coaching.com where we really are the only integrator in an industry of aggregators. There's nothing wrong with being an aggregator. It's just a business model, right? So the the way coaching works for the digital coaching firms that have raised venture money and have been growing for the last couple of years, it's the same model that we used to have for the incumbents, uh, like the company that I used to work at and like all these large leadership development consultancies that have been around for many years. There's The coaching industry works in the following way. There's independent contracted coaches and they work with a number of different coaching firms. The coaching firms aggregate these coaches. They aggregate essentially content. A lot of them have their own development models. Some of them have multiple models they draw from different uh, authors and places. Um, And then you package that, you provide a layer of uh, standardization, a layer of quality assurance and reliability, and then you go and package that and market that and sell that to the enterprises. So the coaches don't have to do the business development, which they traditionally are not good at. Uh, But then there's that inefficiency created by the middleman connecting the enterprise with the coaches, but that's the way it's always been. So I think in our model of integration is really, we're not a coaching company, like all the digital coaching firms, they're, they're services companies. They're connecting the coaches with the enterprises and they have a layer of technology that the incumbents could never do. So the incumbents struggle to create great technology. No one really thought about the coachee experience until the digital coaching platform starting to pop up. That was the transformation there was like, let's productize the coaching experience and let's have a coachee experience that is akin to what you're used to with other consumer 
digital platforms that we all use. So that was the innovation that started about 2015 or so. Um, now, with our integrator model, we really sit in the middle and we help enterprises navigate managing multiple vendors because we believe that diversity in your pool of vendors is important. You don't want 100,000 people at Chevron being all coached by the same company, right? So right. you want to have that diversity, that being able to fine tune the leadership model that the coaches are going to use. So traditionally, enterprises have purchased from any vendors. So a, our integrator strategy is to enable large companies to manage multiple vendors. So we're not essentially a coaching company. So when I think about technology in terms of innovation and coaching, it's about creating efficiencies in the way coaching is run so that then you can make the the cost per hour of coaching is expensive because coaches are parked most of the time, to use a car analogy, right? They're not doing right. coaching most of the time. And if you are, you start doing it for these, for some of these companies that pay you very little. So the idea is let's get the coaches higher utilization, lower friction by having a technology delivery platform. And, and that's kind of like what we have. We've that kind of the angle that coaching.com has brought to the market and where I think technology can really create efficiency. Uh, gains for the industry as a whole and ultimately provide more access to coaching, but high quality coaching that's scalable for the providers and also from the buyer perspective. Disrupting and democratizing coaching all at once. I love that. Bring it, bring, bring the management of it, not delivery. That, that's that key element, isn't it? Managing all of these coaches, all of these capabilities to have a sort of a portal for organizations to go through and see, pick and choose managed by you, integrated by you, but then it's delivered still by the individual coaches to where they need the most yeah. effective input. So yeah, sounds great. If every coaching company develops their own platform, that's not going to create efficiencies for coaches and it's not going to create efficiencies for the clients. So that was our model. What was like, well, there has to be a platform to kind of put it all together. And I think we have a good domain for that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's great from so far, I've seen it. Yeah, it's great. No, and, and you bring up an, an important point because it's like you see large companies go and decide often because, you know, an executive reads a book and says, right, you know, everyone at this at, at XYZ Corporation is going to get ABC coaching because I, I read this book and I think it sounds great. But if you're if you're running a company, of 100,000 people. That 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 as good as that coaching methodology may be, it's not necessarily the right methodology for every part of your company. The same methodology is not necessarily the right methodology for your accounting and finance team as it is for your engineering right. and R and D team. That's a great point, and I think that speaks to the maturity of the not only just the coaching market but the talent management um function in organizations hr used to not be strategic at all it was just all compliance right right and as the role of hr transitions because you know we've been talking about the war for talent for 20 years and as organizations recognize that the way they attract retain inspire their people has significant implications for the profitability and the long-term sustainability of the organization, there's been more thought put around, okay, what does development look like? So that, I read a book and I'm gonna have everyone go through it approach is really fading away as there's a more strategic function within HR that is really about talent management. And in some cases, you know, that approach has worked, like for Lululemon, everyone was going to the landmark foundation and they built an incredible culture and incredible company. It's kind of bizarre to have everyone go to the landmark foundation for training, but you know, for certain companies in certain stages, it works for yeah. very large organizations. You have to have a cohesive integrated people strategy. And that is really something that I think we've been talking about it for a long time, but it has just really seriously gotten operationalized over the last 10 years. Well, the, this this evolution from HR being about compliance to leadership and talent development is is so so much part of rethinking the whole nature of work, the whole future of work, right? Because everybody's struggling with talent retention, and from a lot of studies that I've seen recently, one of the things that 
employees really value is being part of an organization where they have opportunities to grow and to develop. You know, yeah. I think back to when, 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 when I had a real job and, and worked for newspapers, I don't know if that's a real job, but you know, closest I ever came, uh, the, the newspaper company that I liked working for the most was the one that invested in letting me go to take continuing education classes at the journalism school at Berkeley and stuff like this, you know, every year as part of my job, because I was not just working there, I was becoming better and better every year. And I know that my colleagues all felt the same way. Everyone was like, this is the, this, this is the best thing about our job is that we get to have a little bit of time, a little bit of money to go and continue to, to hone and develop ourselves professionally. And so if you, if you think about that today, where there's this huge competition for talent and you see companies just throwing money at people and it's not working, they just keep up, upping salaries and people are still like, no, I'm done. It's, I think part of it is because people want those things like working for an organization that really invests in them as yeah. people. Uh, absolutely, because then you're going to get the ROI back off the individual, aren't you? We, we talk a lot about engagement or disengagement of individuals in companies. And as you said, Bryce, it's not about the money anymore. It's not about the job we're doing. It's about the opportunities. It's about the personal growth. It's about the professional growth. And it's a quid pro quo scenario. So if you see the company investing in you to put you on courses and training, provide you with funding to do things that not only interest the company and benefit the company, benefit you personally, then you're going to commit back to that company. You're going to build that relationship. You're going to have a loyalty level increase each time that happens. And that's how you get longevity of employees. You get a far better relationship, work workforce, employee relationship. And that's how companies evolve and grow and you maintain that talent and you keep growing that talent. So when you do get people in positions of future leadership, they're capable. We don't see the Peter principle where you're just promoting Bob because he's a good salesman. He's the worst manager and leader ever, but he's a great salesman. You know, but if you if you train that individual to be a leader, and I'm talking about as they step in the door as an intern, don't don't wait until leadership training when Bob gets promoted 15 years in. Start nurturing people early. Give them that capability to go and learn these things that are going to prove you know prove beneficial to them. But also, you're creating that long-term roadmap of future stars in your organization. And the value of that, you, you can't put a dime dollar on that at the moment because the long-term payback is huge. It really is. There, and there's a lot of bobs in organizations that actually <laughs> are more harmful <laughs> because, me. because, sure, Bob's a great salesman, but, but everyone hates working for Bob. So there's a turnover issue. There's an underperformance uh, for that team. And... High level, yeah, it looks like Bob's bringing a lot of money, but uh, I think not addressing that kind of manager yeah. has yeah. second order effects, especially as the world the world of work gets more complex. So being able to provide people with opportunities of learning that are more dynamic, like it used to be that you would sit there and like watch an e-learning course or something and it, like people don't <laughs> like doing that. I mean, don't one of the cool things started. about coaching <laughs> is that it's super dynamic. Hey, I'm going to give you someone that you're going to have a great relationship with. And that person's going to help you find and identify like your best self. And it's going to help you kind of map out the pathway to get there. That's very different than traditional training. And that's kind of part of what the you appeal. mean. But yeah, go and click on nothing this wrong with Bob. But. Go look through the bazillion offerings we have in our digital learning library and see what, see yeah. what stimulates you. Well, nothing does. As you said, Alex, that, that live coaching right. event, that one on one far more effective than online learning in, in any shape or form. Brilliant. Well, this is great Absolutely. stuff. Well, let's take a short break. When we come back, I want to talk about our very exciting new alliance between Red Team Thinking and Coaching.com. Stay tuned. Hey, folks, Bryce here. If you're listening to this and you're liking what you're hearing and you're wondering, am I a Red Team Thinker? We have an easy way for you to find out. Just go to the show notes, click on the link there to our free assessment to find out if you are a red team thinker and what you can do to think more effectively, to lead more effectively, and to make better decisions faster in your complex world. Like I said, the link is in the show notes, or you can simply go to our website, redteamthinking.com. Check it out. I can't wait to see how you score. 
Welcome back. Wow, such a great conversation we've been having, Alex, about the origins of coaching, going all the way back to Aristotle and Socrates. We've been talking about the disruption and democratization of coaching. Now, I would like to talk about red team thinking and coaching. So full disclosure, folks, Alex and I have been friends for many years. Uh, and Alex, one of the things that, that you were really the first person to tell me was, hey, there, there's a, a lot of synergy between red team thinking and coaching, and you ought to figure out how to bring these two worlds together. What did you see about red team thinking? You were one of the readers on my book. Um, what did you see about it that, that resonated with you from a coaching perspective? Yeah, I think essentially, you know, they're trying to do the same thing, which is to change your perspective, to allow you to look at things from a different lens, a different angle. Uh, I think the methodology is a little bit different, but ultimately the outcome and what it's trying to do to the person and their perspective is very much aligned. So it always made sense to me that they were pretty analogous and that actually together as a methodology, you could actually have a very powerful approach, and especially in the context of organizations, given the complexity of the world today. Yeah, given given the, the disruption in the world, the, the uncertainty of the world, the ambiguity of the world today. Mm -hmm. And we have been working together for now in earnest, gosh, um, almost a year on developing a red team coaching program in partnership with your company in partnership with coaching.com. And we just completed the first pilot program of that, which I understand was the best rated coaching pilot you guys have run yet. Is that true? Yeah. We've had a lot of pilots for programs and you guys were the highest rated pilot we've ever had, which is incredible because it's not, the typical coaching program or program for coaches. So I think you guys really accomplished something uh, incredible. And I'm, I'm so excited about this program. I, I, I'm very excited about coaching and its impact in the world. And I've always been very excited about red teaming and to put them together and equip coaches with these capabilities and perspective is I think incredibly yeah powerful. we we sensed that during the pilot didn't we Bryce the the caliber of the coaches obviously that came on were high but when they saw this capability and they started playing with the tools and getting to use them you could see how the the power within those tools and in their hands the light bulbs were coming on they're like wow th this is a whole new level of capability that's going to allow me to be a far more effective coach a far more dynamic and responsive coach, but also how you can quickly help, which the whole purpose of these is to help their clients, their coachees, to also understand these concepts that we're talking about, you know, suspending judgment, looking at things from a different perspective, altering your opinion and ego, which is often half the problem you're trying to battle against with coaches. But yeah, it's great to see. Great to see. And and how quickly they used it, yeah. started using this with their yeah. clients and, that, and, and, and how that was received. We had one coach in our program who came back after just two days. Of, it was, he came back the more, the third day of, of the course. So just after two, two modules. And he said, I, I used this with one of my clients yesterday. And not only was it amazing and led this executive to have this and this epiphany, but this executive has now asked me to train his entire team in this. And we're like, hold on just a second there. Just slow, slow, slow down here. Let's, let's oh. walk before we, we run here. But that just like, he's like, I seriously, he's like, I, I, this guy's like, I need you to train my whole team now in this because that's how quickly the coaches were able to take this and use it and how quickly their clients yeah. were able to see the benefit of it. That's a good yardstick for successful training when you're able to apply it right away. So that is one of the most positive things I've heard that we, while the pilot was going on. And it's a great indicator that there's a lot of value for the coaching community in using these tools. Um, again, I think we should measure the e efficacy and effectiveness yeah. of training by saying, okay, how quickly are you implementing, that's, especially with implementers that's the whole like purpose, coaches? Isn't it? With learning, training, right. instruction. Yep. And we sort of pride ourselves with, you know, trying to make all of our modules you know, easy to learn, instantly applicable, 
with immediate efficacy. And if you get those three things, then the ROI that you can then get from that and the pace with which you can get it is exactly as you said, Alex, that's the perfect yardstick for me of quality training. And for organizations out there, when you have this plethora of training opportunities for your people and you've got to spend money on it, it's hard to choose the ones that are going to provide you with that ROI that you want. Because so often we talk to people where they get sent away on the standard two days training a year or whatever it is they're doing the program. And they come back and go, yeah, it might've been fun and I enjoyed the time away, but I'm not using what I've learned because it's not relevant or there's no efficacy in the organizational context. I'm trying to use this. So I think really helping coaches see that, helping clients see that and bringing those all together is where you really make that difference in coaching.com. I, this is something I really passionately believe in, you know, that you should, you should hold the, the companies that you bring in to train your people accountable for, for an ROI on the investment that you're making. And I don't mean that you need to be able to say, well, we spent, you know, $2,000 on training and we got $3,000 in immediate here, here on our balance sheet is $3,000 that we gained from it. I mean, being able to see in a change in behavior, in a change of decision quality, in a change of leadership abilities, whatever it is immediately. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's something that I, I have really made a principle ever since I started training people in this back in 2015, that everything we do has to be immediately applicable. And we've dropped tools from our training portfolio that are powerful tools, but are so complex that they weren't immediately applicable. So, you know, one of the ones that I'm asked about a lot because people read about it in the book and and, and it sounds kind of sexy is, is string of pearls analysis. And it's an incredibly powerful tool. It's actually probably the most powerful red team thinking tool that, that exists, but it takes it takes a long time to train people how to do it. And it takes an even longer time to do it right. When the army does string of pearls analysis, sometimes they've taken a month to do one analysis, but the results are amazing. But I don't teach that anymore because I only taught it once. And the the company that we taught it to was like, this is a lot to take in. You know, we're still (laughs) trying to struggle to get our heads around this. And, you know, I would rather I would rather put that on the shelf until we can figure out how to make that something that is immediately applicable and teach somebody something else that they are right. Right. Yeah. I learned that yesterday. I used it today. Here's what happened. Yeah. And that's important for the coaching context because um, coaches are working with people that are very busy and the coaching needs to be a quick hit. Right. So sometimes, in fact, some really you see that especially at the kind of master level coach sometimes coaches will have a 20 minute coaching session when they were scheduled for 60 because they hit on what they needed to hit on the clients ready to go and implement and then report back on on kind of what uh, uh, what's what are some of the what's the impact of that insight or that conversation and and being able to be dynamic as a coach is important um so the tools that are applicable for coaching from the red team um, perspective, I think are those that are streamlined, yeah. right? Because people are busy. Um, so I think I'm just super excited about what you guys are doing. I've always been excited about red teaming. Um, and the idea of having a large number of coaches go through the training and use it with clients. I mean, this is the kind of thing in, in this complex world that has impact, Huge. you know, it's like one little thing has yeah. a cascading consequence and t- Coaches are really like vessels for development in the world because they go. That's the re- that's the thing that drives me for the program side of our business. That you can partner with incredible thought leaders and create incredible learning experiences for coaches that then go and talk to you know thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people, and you use these models and. I think that is a catalyst for change and a lot of the change that we want to see in the world. So that's why I think coaching is very powerful because coaches are agents of change. They are absolutely agents of change. And and I love how, and I've just got some feedback I'm going to read out in a minute from yesterday, how coaches are these people who can go into organizations and slow them down in the way that it allows the organization to then accelerate. 
you know, because everyone's going double quick. Everybody's got to be, you know, under the cosh of speed, we call it. And by doing that, they're not taking the time to observe, see what's going on. And in a complex world, that pace will cause you to fail. And there's a great comment here from last night, a lady who came through the last night class we did. It doesn't take long to run a red team thinking session. Is it better to be fast or thoughtful and quick? And I thought that was brilliant. Is it better to be fast or thoughtful and quick? You got to slow down to speed up. I mean, that that is, yeah, that's absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you see that, you know, you see you, because of the world we live in today, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, you saw so many companies rushing to try to, to, to meet the challenge of the pandemic and falling flat on their face by just doing stupid, stupid things that if they had just slowed yeah. down and thought unforced about errors, yeah. right? Absolutely. Exactly. So I love that. I, unforced I, errors. I just read the Agassi biography. Incredible. I mean, if the people listening haven't read it, I did the audiobook version. Uh, it was, it was really interesting because one of the big inflection points for Agassi was when he recognized through his coach that he wasn't letting other people make mistakes and play because he was so enthralled with like the idea of just being perfect that sometimes instead of just putting the ball past the net, he would try to go for the perfect mm -hmm. shot and he would miss. And that would be a missed opportunity. He wasn't letting his opponent play. And by letting them play, you let them make mistakes. Yeah. So he was making right. all the unforced errors. And I thought that was, I, I mean, when that. you think about someone at that level, in a, such a cool sport like tennis, uh, that that it was an insight mm -hmm. that was transformative in his career. That is just so incredibly powerful because it makes so much sense. You're like, oh, okay. But letting other people play, slowing down to speed up, it, it is really one of the most important things that one can do. And it's applicable in such a broad range of, of fields. It is. There's a military principle, and I can't remember which which great military strategist came up with it and said it better than I'm going to say it. But never interfere with your enemy when they're making a mistake. <laughs> and 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 it's it's really interesting if you look at if you look at uh, in the during the Burma campaign in World War II, Field Marshal Viscount Slim, the the British commander, he 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 uh, had the Japanese on the ropes finally after many years. And the Japanese commander was making one mistake after another because he finally, you know, he'd been really successful when he had the initiative. But now that the British had the initiative, he was just making blunder after blunder. And in the midst of this, Marcus's gang, the RAF, came in and they said, we've got aerial surveillance, aer aerial reconnaissance. We found his headquarters in the jungle. And we'd like your permission to, to launch a bombing raid on his headquarters. And, and Field Marshal Slim said, are you kidding me? Draw a red circle around that on your bombing maps and don't bomb anywhere near that. I don't want this guy wounded or killed. I want him to stay in charge so he can <laughs> keep, keep making mistakes. It up. Yeah. yeah. And, but I mean, that's the thing is, is, you know, it's, it's, it's people are, you know, it, if you let people run without thinking, yeah. they will trip. Taking the time to observe, isn't it? As you said, Alex, you know, just stepping back and that, Having that coach, I'm sure Agassi's coach pointed this out to him, and just it's that, it's that taking that moment of mindfulness, we call it, you know, just step back, observe what's going on around you, observe how you're feeling, how you're behaving, what you're doing before you start running. Because if you don't, you know, your shoelaces are going to be untied, you're going to trip over the first hurdle rather than being ready, being focused, being capable, competent, cognitively aware, then you're going to clear those hurdles without even thinking. But so many people, as we just discussed, just blunder into these things because it, I don't know whether that's the default human reaction, system one brain kicking in, the expectations of the boss, the organization, the markets, who knows? But it, it's it's a constant problem we're seeing. What do we say? Bad leaders <laughs> react. Yeah. Good leaders plan and great leaders think. Well, I mean, when you think about the idea of like being like a, a man of action or person of action you know it's yeah. it's ingrained in in the way even well i guess it's so old school that very it's much a man of action yeah you know? we don't talk like that that, that showcases kind of where yeah. that comes from right but it's like the it's like the worst thing you can do is do nothing yeah. uh well maybe that works in a complicated world where you have to get things moving 
but the world's moving and it's actually spitting out of yeah. control. So in a world that is you do the opposite going through yeah. that, you got to do the opposite. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great advice. So much great advice in this episode. So many great ideas and so excited to be partnering with coaching.com Alex and developing red team coaching and, and making these tools and techniques available to hopefully legions of coaches worldwide. There's nothing I'd like more than to enhance the impact that coaching has by providing such an incredible tool uh, and really tool set and approach and methodology like red team thinking. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, cheers for red team coaching. It's so exciting. Let's work together and change the world. Thank you. Cheers, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for tuning in to The Thinking Leader. Check the show notes for more information about the topics covered in this episode there. You'll also find a link to our free assessments. Click on it right now to find out if you are a red team thinker with a red team culture.